this is not about science 2.0, it's about big data, uh, but I hope it's uh, interesting uh, nevertheless. So this is part of uh, lots of different things that we're doing at the Oxford Internet Institute in the big data space. Uh, I have a number of different collaborators. Um, is it okay? Yeah. Ah, so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Is that good? Okay. Um, many collaborators on these projects that I'm going to talk about. Uh, so this is very much a team effort. Uh, but that's, that's what these projects are focused on is big data. And that's the overview, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the projects first of all. I'm going to talk about the questions that big data raises. I'm going to talk about the different issues. And then we really get to the meat of the talk, the definition of big data. And then I'm going to talk about how big data changes knowledge, scientific knowledge, knowledge in the humanities. And I'm going to give some examples, and then I'm going to broaden out again to uh, the implications of all this. What are the ethical, social, and other implications of big data research? And hopefully then conclude. So let me start by saying that uh, big data, uh, I don't know how it is in Germany, but I mean in, in the Anglo-American world, it is certainly uh, incredibly hyped up. Uh, there's a huge, I mean, conferences are just mushrooming left, right, and center. Everybody wants to know about big data. So you have that on the one hand, a huge amount of interest. And then on the other hand, you have people who, you know, you meet all the time who say, well, this is not really new. We've always been doing big data, right? Nothing new here. <laughs> this is all complete hype. So I'm going to steer uh, a nice, not in-between position, <laughs> but a, a different one. And I'm going to try to say that there is something new about big data and that it forces us to really think about what the scientific process is all about. And that's the argument uh, that I'm going to make a bit later. But let me start by saying that uh, the, the big issue that's raised about uh, big data um, Chris Anderson did this with the end of theory article, which is quoted endlessly. You know, is it all over for scientific theory? Are we just going to trawl through this huge sea of data and just data mine it and we no longer need to do proper science? Or to put it differently, is the tail wagging the dog? Is it the case that we just throw out questions? We don't start with questions anymore in research. But instead, what we do is we just look at the data, right? Because we have so much of it. And that would obviously be a rather fundamental shift in how we do uh, research. So I'm going to come back to all those questions. But uh, let me just highlight some uh, research that some master students of our uh, at the Oxford Internet Institute did a couple of years now already. Uh, which used big data techniques and um, was during the last American election. And so they looked at the uh, uh, Twitter followers of both Mitt Romney and of Barack Obama. And they found with a statistical probability of 0% that the followers of Mitt Romney were real followers, Twitter followers. In other words, they looked at these followers and they found out that they were really just bots, that they were really just agents that Romney had paid for in order to show how many Twitter followers he had. So this is the kind of analysis uh, that you can do with big data if you have those kinds of sources. But that was just a little aside. Let me uh, before coming to the heart of the talk, let me talk a little bit about the projects that we're doing. So the uh, funders that are funding the one project that I'm primarily working on at the moment is called Accessing and Using Big Data to Advance Social Science Knowledge. And it's funded by the Sloan Foundation. And uh, we have done well over 100 interviews by now with lots of different social scientists. We've looked at reports, workshops, we've had conferences and so on. Uh, 
where we try to get these big data researchers together to talk about the challenges, the issues of using big data, of analyzing uh, big data, and so on. And I think it's very interesting to uh, think about what kind of skills, what kind of challenges uh, people need nowadays for big data analysis. I mean, I was just uh, talking yesterday with Katrin. They have a degree now in computer, or they have an institute now with computational social science, right? There are lots of different labels for what we're doing in social sciences with uh, big data. Do you need a computer science degree nowadays to, to do social science? Uh, that's one question that we often ask ourselves at the institute. And I think there's considerable amount to be said for the fact that you know, nowadays there is much more interdisciplinary uh, work going on, that very often you have computer scientists working with social scientists on these large uh, data sets. So that's one project and that's uh, coming to an end uh, this year. And this is the kind of template that we have for the project. So we look at various types of data that are used by social scientists, depending on whether it's open or closed and private and public and so on. So there are some examples here on this slide. But we have a lot of different uh, papers coming out of this project. And I'm putting up at the end a slide where we have different uh, publications that are either ongoing or in press, where we look at different disciplines, such as geography, development studies, uh, how big data is used in, in analyzing Wikipedia and so on. That's the outcome of this project. And again, I mentioned that we have a, a, a lot of different interviews and I could show you a lot of different quotes from social scientists, but I won't focus on that because I want to focus on some of the more uh, kind of fundamental issues in this area. And then we have, uh, you know, you can also analyze the hype about big data with uh, scientometrics. You can look at the number of articles that are published. And, of course, this curve is only until 2012, so it's still uh, rising very steeply, I imagine, uh, that there is this interest in big data. Then we have another project which has just started, and, of course, big data is, to a large extent, uh, driven by commercial needs, right? It's driven by uh, marketing and by health and by other uh, companies to analyze customers and that kind of thing. And so for this project, which is funded uh, through the UK, through a network, we're looking at business models in big data and how these vary, depending on, for example, you know, how the data is accessed. Is it in, within, the, within your own firm? Is it outsourced? Who's doing the analysis? Is it a team inside the company? Is it uh, done outside? And so on, the issues of where the where, whether public or private data is used. Those kinds of issues uh, are, is what we're looking at in that project. And this is just uh, you know, a slide that shows that there are lots and lots of different companies involved in this area. So I just talked about this. And again, a question is what kind of expertise is needed in this uh, field if you want to do big data analysis uh, in or with companies. Uh, you pretty much need uh, certain uh, skills. But I think, and this comes to kind of the, the, the main thrust of the talk, I think one of the questions that we can raise is what are big data sources actually used for when they are used uh, via analytics? And I think one of the things that they're used for, or perhaps the main one, is to sort people into different categories. And it sorts them into categories in order to predict their behavior, let's say purchasing behavior on Amazon or something like that, in order to manipulate them. <laughs> now, I should really put quote marks around manipulate, because what I mean by manipulate is just that you, know, you try to do things to people. You try to well, I guess manipulate comes from the Greek or Latin or something, using your hands. You're really just trying to get people to do something. You try to steer them in a, in a particular direction. So I don't mean the word manipulate in the kind of negative sense. That's just what you're trying to do using big data. You're trying to change people in some, or steer them, I should say. 
And I guess one of the questions that I'm going to start pursuing now for the uh, remainder of the talk is to ask, well, what's social science's role in this? <laughs> Do we also seek to manipulate people? <laughs> And my short answer is, no, we're pretty nice guys on the whole. I mean, we, you know, we're not very threatening. We try to do our research. We try to answer some big questions. But in a way, that's also what we're contributing to, is kind of making people, that's after all what social science is all about, understanding people, we're trying to make them more amenable to manipulation. So that even though we may not be the bad guys, at least we contribute to knowledge that can understand people in a more powerful way. And I think one of the reasons for saying that is that the social sciences don't often have the reputation of being very powerful. Uh, oops. Uh, you know, we're not known to have very uh, uh, knowledge that is regarded as very high-powered in the sense that you can do very much with it. In fact, the reputation of the social science is often the opposite. But I'm going to claim or argue that, in fact, uh, this big data movement is contributing to making social science more powerful. Now, um, oh, and this is the very famous uh, Target article that I'm sure many of you have read about. Uh, you know, a company knows before uh, the parents do that a uh, teenage girl is pregnant uh, because uh, they figured out who buys what in combination and they use big data in order to um, uh, communicate to the parents that the girl is pregnant before she does. This is such a well-known example that I'm sure I don't need to go through it. Okay, so I've kind of sketched the parameters here, I've talked about the projects, I've talked about the issues. Uh, time to get down to business. Uh, let's define big data because uh, that, I think, is at the heart of the issue. What is it? <laughs> You've got these various definitions from uh, consulting companies, three Vs, ver velocity, variety, and volume, and so on. That doesn't really do it for me. <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, it's nice, but it's not very precise. Uh, my definition is that it's the advance of knowledge via a leap in the scale and scope in relation to a given object or phenomenon. Okay, that's a, a mouthful. But what it's trying to say is that you have existing ways of doing things and then you really need a step change. You really need a change in quality or quantity in what you're doing in relation to a particular phenomenon under investigation. I'm going to give some examples uh, in a moment. So you need a leap. You do need something that is a, is a radical break that makes big data analyses different from others. I'm going to give some examples in a moment, so I'll come back to this. But it strikes me that the more, even more important question that big data raises is, what is data? And um, I've been going around for quite some time, because we've been doing work in e-science and in related areas, I've been quite going around to, to, to a lot of different people and asking, well, what is data? Uh, and Maybe there's an expert in the room, but I haven't been able to find a definition anywhere. <laughs> uh, not among information scientists, not among computer... Well, I mean, there are some definitions that, uh, that, 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 that are very loose, but there aren't really any very tight ones. And this has really prompted me to think about what it is that drives knowledge and why data is so important to it. So I've made my own, and here it is. And it consists of three elements. The data belongs to the object in the first instance. So one of the reasons that we have so much big data now is that we have lots of objects out there in the world that are giving off big data. Right? So, I mean, I'm going to use this example again and again, but Twitter, mobile phone location, and so on, these are objects that just happen to have lots and lots of data attached to them. 
So it belongs to the object. Then we get very philosophical, and uh, there's a philosopher of science that I like to draw on. Uh, he's very good. He's a realist. He's a pragmatist. And he makes the very interesting point that taking data comes before interpreting. Uh, or, to use the full quote, all data are of their nature. The view that all data of the, are of their nature interpreted is misleading. Data are made, so obviously you have to clean data, you have to put it into some shape or form, but as a good first approximation, the making and taking comes before the interpreting. Right now you can think even back to this question that I raised at the beginning, do questions come before the data or do, do data come before the questions? Anyway, interpreting comes after taking data. And the third part of the definition is they are the most atomizable or useful unit of analysis. And I think that applies to any uh, field of endeavor, whether it's humanities, sciences, and so on. So that they're most divisible, they're the smallest, if you like, divisible elements that are useful for driving knowledge forward. Now, I need to take a short detour here and say that these three, I think, make sense, and I could argue uh, at length about why they make sense, and it's, it's, I think, a reasonable definition of data that I've tried on various people, and they seem to th think it makes sense. But if you agree with these three, uh, then if you're in the sociology of science or in the sociology of knowledge, uh, in that subdiscipline within the social sciences, you would never ever agree with these three elements of the definition. <laughs> because if you agree with them, then you're a realist, you're a kind of determinist, and in the sociology of science, everybody is a constructivist. Data are inherently political. They are inherently social. They are inherently uh, driven by capitalism. And I'm going to give some examples of people who say this later on. They are never, uh, one of the things that you hear about data is, data are never anything without their context. And if this definition is correct, then actually data is precisely something that is without context in the first instance. So, I mean, I'd, uh, <laughs> Professor Köhler was talking about the difference in different disciplines and, you know, that are represented here. I don't know how many sociologists of science are in the audience, but if I was speaking at a sociology of science conference now, they would be kind of, they would be rushing at me and kind of trying to, you know, get me to shut up <laughs> and disagree with me and so on. Because this is all about, you know, whether knowledge is true or not and whether science really makes progress and so on. And I think this definition, I think, comes to the rock bottom of why science uh, advances. Anyway, so these are the three elements. Now, some of what I'm going to say is about uh, whether, why this definition is useful. Uh, and I'll come back to that in a few slides. Anyway, so let's uh, put this in a broader context. I mean, I think if that's the definition of data, then we've been working for quite a long time about uh, e-science and e-research. And I think one of the reasons that data and big data are becoming so important is because you can manipulate them. And you can manipulate them with machines. You can manipulate them with technologies. And at the end of the day, it's about the mathematics. It's about the software and the algorithms. Algorithms, of course, is a big word in the big data space. It's about the algorithms to manipulate data. And there are very good reasons why, when you train algorithms on data, people can rapidly understand those objects, make progress in relation to those objects, and move forward. If somebody does a Twitter analysis that says, the statistical likelihood that somebody will influence someone else via Twitter is such and such, using this data set, then if you have the right mathematics and statistics, then you can immediately 
see whether there's a more powerful way of doing the same analysis that improves on the previous man- analysis. And that's really what I mean by computational manipulability, that you can rapidly achieve agreement and move forward. And I think this is part of a larger trend that we have throughout the sciences uh, from using computers in different ways, from using supercomputing through the grid. We've been to Web 2.0. I don't know whether we're beyond Web 2.0, cloud, big data. These seem to be part of a longer series of trends. And big data is only the most recent, which focuses on uh, uh, the availability of objects with a lot of data attached to them. And this just shows that you have these tools, you have different movements that kind of try to implement these tools, and then you get transformations of research fronts in different areas where you're using these tools. And here's just a, 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 an outline of what you have. You have the real world giving off digital data, and you're able to represent and manipulate that data in a more powerful way. Now, what use is this understanding of big data? What can you really do with it? Well, I think one of the things that it makes you think about is how many objects do we really have that are suitable for big data analysis? And my claim would be that we have quite a lot of new ones, they have quite a lot of big data, but there aren't a huge amount. In other words, big data is also limited. It's limited to the exploitation of suitable objects. And the knowledge, of course, is, in the social sciences at least, uh, used in order to do things with people. And of course, what that means is that If you take mobile phone data, to switch the example, we're giving off a certain amount of data. Companies that want to market products to us or geographers who may want to track our movements through space can do things in terms of analyzing us, but those things that they can do to us are also limited by the object that they have available. Let me go through that uh, in a little bit of detail. So here, I've just uh, put together a sample of different big data studies. I've claimed that it makes a leap in the scale and scope in relation to a given object or phenomenon. And here are just three classical areas, Facebook, Twitter, and Wikipedia, where people have done analyses that exemplify my definition, which is a leap in the scale and scope in relation to the given phenomenon. So they've analyzed a lot of different links between people and what, the, what people do with each other. And they have uh, certain key findings about what people, uh, how you can understand the relationships between people. But, and this is a key point that I want to raise here, what types of relationships between people can you really understand, understand from these data? Because the objects to which the data attach really are not very many dimensional. I mean, in Twitter you have tweets, you have retweets, and maybe one or two other hashtags, in other words, content, but they don't give you a huge, rich, and in-depth understanding of people who use Twitter in a larger context, and you still have to understand, of course, who uses Twitter and what it does in their lives. So I'm not going to go through these in any detail, but uh, uh, just a few examples here. Google, a study of, uh, by Waller, who looked at Australian Google users. And she had the data from not just Google searches, but also from Experian Hitwise, the marketing company. And so she could classify what people do when they search in Australia on Google. And Google has the dominant share, I mean, 99%. 98% or something like that. And her findings are quite interesting uh, because what you might think in terms of Australian Google users is that different classes use Google to search for quite different things. 
right? So very, you know, people in the highest social class might search for BMW and uh, Riverside Hotel where you can stay <laughs> in a very posh surrounding, whereas other people might uh, search for, you know, youth hostel on the other side of Hamburg and used cars and so on. What does she find? Actually, that's not the case. People search for the same thing no matter which social group they're in. And this is really quite interesting from a social science point of view. And so I think that's a great study. Uh, text analysis, uh, the culturomics, I won't go into it, I'm sure many of you have heard of it, where you analyze very large scale uh, 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 textual corpora. Google Books is used, other you, uh, corpora of uh, novels and so on are used, and you can find some interesting things uh, about it. And in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through this. Um, Quark et al. study of is Twitter a, a social network or a, a news medium analyzed a very large number of uh, tweets in order to find this out. But this example really, sorry, let me go back to this example. This example really highlights some of the possibilities and limitations of uh, big data to my mind. Because the findings are that it that it's more one thing than another. But the whole question that we have to ask in relation to Twitter is, you know, what does it tell us about users in the first place? No matter whether they're using it as a news medium or as a social network primarily. And this is a lot of where big data studies are stuck, so to speak, because they have a lot of really interesting novel findings based on the fact that they have such a leap in the amount of data available but it's not theorized very well. We don't really have a good understanding of what the implications are we, against the background of, let's say, traditional media studies, which also try to analyze social influence or the importance of news in people's lives. So that's a real limitation at the moment. And here's just the most, most recent example that we've done. We've analyzed the UK web space, uh, so looking at uh, very, very many uh, links. It's uh, terabytes of data. Uh, it's part of a new project that we have about looking at how the web reflects certain other historical or cultural trends. And uh, just very briefly, you can look at certain tr changes in uh, the number of parts to uh, devoted to particular parts of the web space, whether it's org, .ac, which is the academic domain, .gov, or the commercial domain, .co. Uh, you can see that over the course of time. You can see it changing. And then you can do interesting things like, are these things linked to each other in different ways? And this is uh, not represented to scale because .co, you can, uh, .co domain is much larger than the others, but if you were to look at the links and how they changed over time as between them, you can see that the, uh, that the nature of the UK web domain uh, has certain affinities between the different domains and that these have changed over the course of time. Oh, I had that one already. So, uh, let me, I've given some examples. I've had my definition of big data and of data. Uh, this is just a different way of uh, saying what I said earlier, that big data really uh, is in this middle space here, that you have these data sets in relation to given uh, objects or phenomena, and that you're able to represent and manipulate uh, these data and the things that they pertain to them. And the reason that I have representing at one end and manipulating at the other is that this is really a difference between, let's say, social science which often only tries to represent relationships between people, and at the other end, much more policy relevant or much more applied sciences, which try to do something with that knowledge. So marketing is a good example. But you might also use big data knowledge in order to manipulate people that comes from the .gov domain or that comes from government websites. Right? You might try to nudge people by presenting information in a particular way based on big data analysis. You might try to change their behavior, and that would fall more towards the manipulating end of the spectrum. So you have the whole spectrum from 
pure science as against manipulation at the other end. And I would argue that big data will fall somewhere inevitably between these. So coming back to this question that I raised, what does this enable you to do? Well, it enables you to kind of tease apart where big data is important and where not. And here are just two exhibits uh, uh, that I think are quite interesting. So in the New York Times recently, I've came across this article uh, which looked at Google Plus. And uh, Google Plus, I, do people use Google Plus? How many people use Google Plus? Yeah, okay, so a few of you. Uh, how many people use Facebook? Right, that's quite a few more, <laughs> okay. So uh, what this article said, and I think this is quite interesting in relation to my argument, this article really just said, I'm not going to give you exact figures and reproduce the article, but it said Google Plus is really a lot smaller than Facebook, right? And Google Plus very often is used, but very infrequently, like I signed up a long time ago, but I hardly ever use it. And when I go around the rooms like this, that's very often the experience, right? People sign up and they say, okay, I can't really do anything with it. And this article really made the point that despite the disparity in users, and despite the fact that we didn't, people like myself don't even use it, Google Plus may tell you more about people than Facebook does. Why? This comes back at the base to the definition of big data that I gave. It relates to the object and the number of digital data points that you have about people in relation to that object. Because if you sign up for Google+, even if you don't use it anymore, it's looking at what you search, it's looking at what's in your Gmail, it's looking at uh, YouTube comments, because Google bought YouTube. So it can combine those data into a very powerful profile of you as a user. And that makes it more powerful even than Facebook studies, of which I mentioned several uh, a moment ago, which, with which you can do quite a lot. Or the other uh, exhibit, uh, I think that's interesting, is this uh, study of Facebook likes and how it can predict individual user attributes. And I think one of the things that uh, it can do based on your attributes is then you know, depending on your demographic characteristic, it, it can advertise different things to you depending on your profile. So, for example, uh, to just pick out the last sentence here, advertisements might emphasize security when facing emotionally unstable neurotic Facebook users, but stress potential threats when dealing with emotionally stable ones. Now, this doesn't seem very <laughs> uh, odd, but if you think about it, I mean, if I'm using my Facebook account and I'm kind of clicking like a maniac just for, because I'm bored or through some other reason, this study might think that I'm a neurotic user. And then they might give me advertisements based on that, even though I might not be neurotic and just have been clicking on the Facebook, whatever it is, likes or what have you giving the indication that, that I'm that kind of person. So again, come back to my definition. You know, the data can manipulate you, but it's only on the basis of the data that it has available about you, and that means that it might very much misinterpret you. Now, if you say that to a big data analyst, then of course they say, well, that's fine. You know, we've misinterpreted this person who likes Amazon this book and also likes this book. We've misinterpreted this Facebook user who was just clicking on the screen like a neurotic maniac and uh, you know, misclassified him or her. But it's big data, it comes out in the wash, right? It doesn't matter because we've got millions of data points and no matter if we misclassify a few people, it doesn't matter. The point I'm obviously driving at is that this may not matter to the big data researcher, but it very much matters to the person who's misclassified as a neurotic and who gets the wrong kind of advertisements. And you can think of other cases where, you know, that's a relatively mild example, but you can think of others that are quite different. So I'm not going to be able to finish uh, all these slides, but 
the main point that I want to say is that the objects which give off uh, digital data are limited. In the social sciences, you can see this quite clearly. I mean, big data shows a lot of promise now, rightly so, because there are these new mobile phones, social media. They're still growing very rapidly, but they're also limited. I mean, there's a natural limit to how much digital data that we can give off, in the end, I would argue. And I think Given that this conference is about science 2.0, I would just make the point, as an aside, that this also applies to science 2.0. I mean, we're using scientometrics. We have lots of new objects of phenomena, right? We have not just the article, we have the words in the article, we have the abstract, we have the keywords, but we also have the tweets, we have the number of times it's shared, we have this, that, and the other thing. But at the end of the day, the amount of stuff that we have about how knowledge travels and about its impact is limited. And it's contained and it will grow, but that growth will still be contained. And I think that relates particularly to the impact of knowledge, which of course we have now more, much more powerful tools for studying, but they also uh, tell us limited things. Let's skip over that. So, Big data studies in social science are typically whole universe studies. So you no longer take a sample, you just take the whole thing. All of Twitter, all of Facebook, all of Wikipedia. And there are lots of problems with that, with replicability. Can you really get access to the data and so on? So my view would be that big data, no matter whether it's used in the humanities, natural sciences, or social science, is scientizing research, is scientizing knowledge, is making knowledge more scientific. But in the big data space, there are pros and cons to that. You have replicability in some cases where you have access to the data set, you have total data sets, no sampling is needed, and you can readily manipulate the data at least. And there's a very close fit between the data and the objects. I mean, in social sciences, you used to go out with you know, clipboards and ask people, how do you feel about this, that, and the other thing. Now you just say, okay, <laughs> give me all of what Facebook thinks that you, that you uh, are going to vote in the next election and let's analyze it. But there's also limits to that. And that is that the, there's a limited access to objects. You need skills. Uh, very often the data sources are not uh, easily obtainable. You don't know how the data were gathered and so on and they capture only very limited dimensions. This is really the key relationship to the definition I gave. And you have the object in isolation, so you still need to theorize it. So there are lots of issues about this, and I think a lot of the issues in the commercial domain, in the government domain, not so much in the social science domain, although to some extent as well, is that there's an asymmetry between the knower and what you, between the knower and the subject of what's known. Right? You may be doing something on Wikipedia, and you may collaborate in this particular way, but the analyst who knows Wikipedia and has analyzed millions of data points knows a lot more about you than, uh, than what you could possibly know from your own Wikipedia contributor point of view. So, what's the solution? Well, the solution is that since I think that knowledge on the whole grows, I think this isn't going to go away. I mean, this knowledge is just going to creep forward, no matter how many regulations and how many safeguards we put into place. But obviously, in the research world, we simply need more awareness. Uh, we need more regulatory uh, uh, interventions in order to safeguard privacy and so on. So where does my view of uh, big data differ from others? Well, Victor Meyer Schoenberger, my uh, good colleague and next door neighbor, uh, has uh, documented these for the commercial space uh, very well. I think where I would just depart from him is that uh, he's not so much interested in social science or in the sciences. He's much more interested in the big data world in, in business. And so he thinks about those kinds of implications and the legal dimensions. I'm thinking much more about knowledge per se. I think uh, Crawford and uh, Kate Crawford and Dana Boyd, of course, uh, have argued about uh, you know, 
that knowledge is in in inherently political and that it's a product of or a project of neoliberal capitalism and you know big evil big data so to speak and big data causing incredible epistemological problems my view is rather different from that because the Big data isn't only a project of neoliberal capitalism because, for example, you have open data initiatives and you have government initiatives which have nothing to do with capitalism. Or again, China. There are big studies of Weibo and other phenomena and social media in China. China, last I heard of it, wasn't neoliberal capitalist state. <laughs> or the final counterexample is Wikipedia. There, the data sources are open, they're openly available. It's not like Twitter, it's not like a capitalist company where you can't just say, please give me your data, or Google, you, please give me your data. There, there are issues of access. But those issues of access don't pertain everywhere. So I don't think this is the right way forward. But nevertheless, uh, big data has a lot of policy implications, and that's the last thing that I would really want to get to, which is just that the the academic world is quite different from the commercial world in terms of its pressures to produce big data knowledge. Uh, both have limits that I spoke about in relation to the objects. Uh, you have uh, the differential availability of objects to researchers, and that is a problem that uh, Roger Burroughs and Mike Savage pointed to, that very often as social sciences, uh, science researchers were disadvantaged in relation to those commercial players in terms of the data sources that we have available. But again, you know, we have Wikipedia, we have lots of open data sources, so that's not entirely uh, the case either. So there are lots of new objects, but they're not infinite. And I think this availability of objects that have big data, that's going to determine uh, really the future of uh, big data research. And so the outlook here is that you have rapidly growing knowledge uh, because you have research fronts which are rapidly able to accumulate knowledge, agree, move forward, manipulate the data, improve upon existing uh, ways of understanding people and uh, go beyond that. In the sciences, of course, uh, you have lots of new understandings of the physical world, uh, depending on the objects again available, and again, this kind of knowledge will inevitably grow with the availability of those objects, but there are certain uh, limits to that. But in terms of the privacy and other uh, implications of it, there will be creep. There are kind of ways in which this whole process is moving forward in a kind of unstoppable way. And the main social science objects are social media and mobile phones and others. And that's what we have and social media may grow, but that's what we have for the foreseeable future. And so once the world fills up, so to speak, with social media, that's the amount of stuff that we're going to have. So, final slide, um, conclusions. What are the implications uh, for research? Well, one of the things is that this is a very new area. So we have lots of Twitter studies, Wikipedia studies, uh, sensor network studies, studies of people's movements in different countries depending on their mobile phone uses and so on. But we really don't have yet the theoretical understanding. We don't have a good way of embedding these forms of knowledge in our existing repertoire of social science knowledge. So one of the things as a social scientist that's uh, quite frustrating is that you go to, let's say, a, a computer science conference and uh, you, know, you hear about this fantastically rich, powerful, new analysis uh, and you hear things like, oh yes, and by the way, uh, we've discovered that there's something called network analysis or social network analysis. And you think to yourself, Geez, you know, that's only been around in social sciences for about 80 years, you know. I mean, you've been asleep for a long time there. So, I mean, I'm kidding, but it really does feel like we really need a lot more theoretical work. Also, mainly in understanding what these social media mean in terms of their everyday uses. Because without that, you can have lots of big data sets, you get very powerful analyses, but you don't really understand the social implications for society. 
What's the implication for research policy? Uh, here, I think a lot more should be done, and I think there are moves, but very, very tiny ones, towards making open data sets available for people. I mean, to really share. This is an opportunity that we have to share, to build a knowledge base, to pool our resources, and so on. There are obviously difficulties there, but we can really make progress, especially in the social sciences, if those infrastructures are somehow you know, if there are funding mechanisms, if there are ways of incentivizing people not just to share their findings but also to share their resources. And I think we heard some of that yesterday. I think that's still in a very early stage. For society, I mean, we live in a post-Snowden, post-WikiLeaks world. Uh, I think there is a point where, I mean, I, I said earlier in a very kind of casual way, we're not the bad guys as social science as scientists. We're, we tend on the whole to be fairly harmless. But I think it's quite likely that we're going to be perceived as more and more potentially harmful uh, because we do have more powerful knowledge now. And I think that might be uh, something that we need to think much more uh, clearly about. Uh, and we need to have a lot of transparency about how we gather the data. We need to have, make sure that people's privacy is respected and so forth. Now, one of the reasons for saying this is, and this is my final point, that I think at the moment, again, in the light of Snowden and so on, we tend to think of all this as being uh, a big brother world that big data is uh, creating, right? But then I started rereading uh, this other book that was also published uh, roughly at the same time, Brave New World. I don't know how many of you have read that one. But that's actually, to my mind, a much more interesting one to think about. Not necessarily, I mean, it obviously doesn't talk about big data. It's a much more interesting one. Because what Brave New World really tells you about is that we ourselves are very much implicated in the process of new knowledge that's good for us. Right? Yes, I want Google to know where I am because that might allow me to do this, 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 and the other thing. Right? But what am I getting in exchange? Oh, well, okay, I'm giving my private data away. That's a minor cost to you know, giving Google my data for which I get lots of benefits. Similarly with social science research. You know, there might be a lot of benefits of social science research and we might creep up on us how we can use it very fruitfully. But I think that's the, that's the much bigger danger, I think, that we face, not Big Brother so much as Brave New World, where a much more powerful science is created, where social sciences can also play a role. And that's the final thought that I want to leave you with. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for this very interesting talk. And uh, what i like to know your opinion about would be, um, have you any um, knowledge of projects in the social sciences that aim to combine big data or data collected from um, social media or other sources with, uh, let's say, survey, interview, other data? And um, do you see that coming? Mm. Yeah, that's a really good question because, I mean, I think... One of the problems there that you have is that there's a huge asymmetry, right? Because you have the total universe, as I said, for many big data objects, uh, and at the same time, a survey you don't have. And so ideally, of course, for example, in the Google study of, about Australia that I mentioned, ideally you would want to combine that with survey data. But you're never going to get enough resources to, to be able to survey people, let's say, in their homes and say, walk me through how you use the Google search engine. Because that would really give you a kind of ground truth about what they're doing. Because again, this, this analysis, of course, was at a very high level and ignored the fact that you know, people might overlap in the use of the computer, people might use several computers and so on. So I think there is enormous potential there. And it's not a problem that, is, uh, that can't be overcome in uh, in theory, but in practice it's quite different because you, you need a lot of resources to do it. And so I'm not aware of people who've done it very successfully, to be honest. But that would be the way forward. And of course, when I say it's not a problem that you can, cannot overcome in theory, 
you can use sampling. Right? You can just take a sample, depending, of course, on the data source, and you can say, well, I'm going to pick out a few people. And I think that might be really powerful uh, if you could do that. Uh, Erich Weichselgarten, the Leibniz Institute for Psychology Information. Thank you, too, for this interesting talk. My question is that I'm not really interested in data as a scientist. I'm interested in models and theories. So uh, you touched it a little bit, but what are the implications of big data on model building? Right. That depends on what you mean by model building. But I think one of the things that I want to get away from is the fact that you know, it is always, I mean, science to my mind, no matter where it is, is always a kind of moving together in step of models and data. You know, this whole question of which came first, the model or the data, is really the chicken and the egg. You know, we're never going to get away from that. So I think model building is quite interesting because you can have much more powerful models about the data. And what, one thing that you see, of course, is very powerful visualizations of human behavior. And the immediate response to that that often comes is that those visualizations really need to be done very carefully so that they really speak to the phenomenon that's being uh, investigated, because very often they're quite misleading. And so we really need much better education in social science combined with computer science to make sure that some of the, and probably I'm guilty of that myself when I use this web space uh, analysis here. You know, that's a very misleading visualization because you really need to put into words at the end of the day what the model really says and what it tells us. I don't know if that's a good answer. Okay. Professor Schroeder, thank you very much for your clear argumentation here. And uh, even though we have learned yesterday that people from the UK or colleagues from the UK do not need German tea, I'd just like to mention that this region here is special for, for trading uh, tea. And that's why we have a little gift for you. Thank you very much.